Have you reorganized your Kent Stein channel? Not yet. Okay, so you're still at your Questions at the end. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Um, I've done cooking demos at uh, a few of the conferences this time, and I have bad news. We will not be cooking in here today. But the good news is I'm still going to spoil your dinner. We've got snacks over there that these guys are graciously plating up for us. And uh, we'll talk about the, uh, the engineering behind it. Actually, really, there's, it's more science than engineering, but I think there's a lot of crossover. And uh, certainly, we can all benefit from it. Um, who here considers themselves to be an engineer? Those of you that didn't raise your hands, what do you do? Like, what do you do? I would consider it an industrial design to be a form of engineering, personally. But I'm not there yet, so. You're on your way. You're an aspiring engineer. I'm an aspiring engineer. And this is good, because this is going to cover a lot of things that you'll get into as you get into your industrial design, right? Uh, in fact, we'll talk about some things that I think are actually related to that. So first off, by the way, who here, you guys are, are all engineers, who cooks? Who considers yourself to be kind of a geeky cook? That's good. Um, I'm going to take you a little bit further down the rabbit hole, I think. Uh, I'm going to take you to a level that, I'll be honest, most of my colleagues in the food world are uncomfortable with. Um, and in fact, I was, uh, I was at a meeting last week, the Utah Baker's Dozen. Uh, they were talking about macarons, nice uh, French cookie. And uh, afterwards, I was talking to somebody, uh, a group of people, about how I take notes. And we'll cover a little bit about my note-taking note here. Uh, but a couple of minutes in, this woman looks at me and says, you're not by any chance an engineer, are you? This is just on how I take notes about cooking, right? Um, there's something very distinct about the way we think that I don't think that a lot of people have incorporated into their, uh, into their cooking. Now, there's some people that have. Um, you guys ever heard of uh, uh, Heston Blumenthal? Anyone? Uh, how about uh, Ferran Adria? You've heard of Ferran? Well, OK, anyone that hangs around me has heard of most of these people. <laughs> Grant Atkins, anyone ever heard of him? These are chefs that uh, they're great just as chefs, they can, they're classically trained, they can do a lot of really great dishes, but they've decided to step outside the box and experiment with new techniques. Uh, and a lot of people are really offended about the fact that we're using all these new techniques. People get scared when we use words like calcium chloride. Does that word scare anyone? Scares me. Scares me. How about sodium chloride? Does that scare anyone? <laughs> Tom wants sodium chloride. <laughs> One of the most important ingredients in cooking, right? Calcium chloride, it's natural in a lot of foods. How about MSG? Anyone worry about MSG? Yes. Raise your hand if you're worried about MSG. Okay, keep your hand up if you're worried about MSG and you eat mushrooms or seaweed. That's where they get it from. They extract it from seaweed. Usually. There's other places they get it from. It's in high concentrations of mushrooms. Uh, there's a lot of things that sound really scary that really aren't that scary. What's that? Nightshade? That's a great question. Anyone know, familiar with nightshade? Can anyone tell me some of the plants in the nightshade family? Potatoes? Anyone else? Tomatoes? Eggplant? There's a lot of plants in the nightshade family that we eat. In fact, the potato in its natural form before we got to it and domesticated it was entirely poisonous. And now we've gotten it to this point where it's pretty healthy for us as long as we don't eat the green parts, right? Uh, did you know there's actually cultures that, it, that consider nightshade, deadly nightshade, to be a salad green? They feed it to their kids when they're young, little bits, because kids don't like, eat, don't like eating salad, right? And they... Uh, they move up, and by the time they get to the adults, they cook it like you know collard greens down in the south. It's interesting. You've got to consider how many thousands of years ago was it that applying heat to fire or fire to heat was considered new technology? So this is, this is an area that I think we're naturally headed towards anyway, and I think a lot of people in this room are really, really good candidates for moving into that area and helping cooks move into that area. I think we're going to get to it eventually. We've had some scary things happen that I think have made a lot of people uh, shy of food technology. 
but uh, there's a lot of really great stuff happening. Uh, we're not going to go into any of the specific, any of the scary ingredients here. Uh, we will talk about a couple of specific ingredients towards the end. Uh, let's talk about some basics. Who, who here has heard this? A pint's a pound the whole world around. Anyone ever heard that? How many pints, or how many ounces are in a pint? 16. How many ounces are in a pound? 16. It makes sense, right? Is it? Problem? <laughs> one's fluid ounces. <laughs> one's fluid ounces and one's ounces by weight. Isn't that one of the most confusing things the British have ever done to us? And yes, it is their fault. Um, and if you go back into British cooking lore, it actually gets much, much worse. In fact, if you get into their monetary system, I mean, seriously, a hay penny? All these, yeah, they, and it makes perfect sense to them because they grew up with it. Um, we'll talk about measurement systems here in a moment in more detail. Uh, a pint's a pound the whole world around. That's actually reasonably accurate for water. Uh, in fact, to a home cook, uh, that's not a bad rule of thumb. For a professional cook, it's a horrible rule of thumb, right? We have different problems that we as engineers understand. We understand that different uh, substances have different densities and therefore are going to have a different weight per equivalent volume, right? Uh, a cup of flour, does anyone know how much a cup of flour weighs? It depends on whether you, you know, take a spoon and scoop it in or whether you scoop the measuring cup in or whether you sift it in. They're all going to give you three completely different weights. Um, one really awesome thing, if you really get serious into cooking, there's this great book here called The Book of Yields. It tells you the average. It will tell you that a cup of flour weighs, um, it's like 4.8 ounces, I think. A cup of sugar weighs 7.1 ounces. And we can actually use that when we're uh, working in the bakery, especially, to, uh, to figure things out. This also tells you that uh, if I have a pound of bananas, with peel and everything, then I'm going to have you know, 0.7 pounds of usable bananas after we've taken away the peels and everything. It's a really great book. Uh, if anyone wants to look at it afterwards, in fact, let me just pass it around. I've got a few things I'll pass around. Um, so, oil is another big one. Is a pint of oil a pound of oil? Maybe not so much. Oil floats in water, right? It might be. In fact, uh, my first bakery job, I got yelled at for trying to weigh out butter. Because butter, as it turns out, is about a pint a pound. Um, in fact, even at the volume we were doing, it was close enough. Um, good rule of thumb. When it actually says, you know, a cup of butter on the box, it's, it's, it's going to be the same, weight or volume. Um, water, it's not so reliable. We'll get to that. So, when we're talking about, like Eric said, or I'm sorry, Ryan said, Ryan with the Eric in his name. Um, when we're talking about water type liquids, a pint's a pound the whole world around, right? Does that sound pretty reasonable? Well, here's the problem. We also have to take temperature into account, right? So a pint of room temperature water weighs differently than a pint of freezing water or a pint of boiling water and so on, right? Yeah, it's, it's a small difference, right? And again, when we're cooking at home, are we going to make a, a loaf of bread with a pint of water? We're not. Well, we might come close to that. When we're working in a professional bakery where they have recipes, or rather formulas, that call for 20 pounds of water, you can't just add 20 pints of water, right? It doesn't work out. So, in reality, a pint's a pound the whole world round, except for when it's not, which is honestly most of the time. Sometimes it is true. Um, I can't tell you the times when it's actually, in fact, really true, but for a home cook it's, it's pretty close, right? So this brings us to a good point. There's a difference between thinking like an engineer and thinking like a chef, right? As engineers, we like things to be precise. We like to know where we're at. We like to understand our environments. Who here, when they got to the conference today, you know, either before or after registering, walked around to get their bearings. <laughs> Tom got here late. He hasn't gotten far. <laughs> we like to know what's going on exactly. We like precision. We like to understand things as well as possible. We know that we're not there yet, but we're getting there, right? But to a chef, chefs like art. 
They like things to be beautiful. The science of things is scary, right? Um, I think it's, it's interesting because there are actually, actually several forms of precise art that a lot of people appreciate. You guys ever seen this before? Anyone tell me who made this? Mondrian. This guy, uh, he was a member of a minimalist art movement. He believed that art should be simple and precise and exact. He thought that this was very beautiful. And I think there's a certain beauty to it. A lot of other people think it's, think it's absolute crap. You know, my two-year-old can do this or whatever, right? Uh, but you, you need to consider whether or not you like it. This is a precise art. Somebody has put some extra time into making sure there's right angles, making sure there's, you notice there's no green or orange or purple. He's only used primary colors here. He's put some effort into making this very precise. How about this guy? Yes. Who did this? Frank Lloyd Wright. This guy influenced architecture more than anyone else in our modern time. You guys, anyone have a carport? Anyone? He invented the carport. Who knew, right? He invented a lot of great architecture. He had a lot of theoretical designs that he did. He had the mile-high building that actually had a half-mile stake going into the ground to keep it from you know, falling over. It was actually designed to sway in the wind. There are buildings now, there are skyscrapers that is designed literally to sway in the wind, right? Which honestly freaks me out because I'm afraid of heights. But <laughs> there's a lot of arch architectural design based on this. This is a very precise art. Architecture in general is a very precise art, right? How about this? Anyone ever seen this before? Would you agree that some thought has gone into making these canopies precise? Looks like we got some melon there, some prosciutto, a little bit of lime. You know, he has gone and put a lot of effort into making these look exactly the same. You can bet that there's a lot of effort that's gone into the flavor, how that lime is going to go with the prosciutto, and how those are both going to go with the melon and so on. This is a chef up in Chicago named Grant Ackett. Um, he is one of the uh, premier people in, in what a lot of people are calling molecular gastronomy. I'm not a big fan of the name, and most of the people that are involved in it hate the name, but the media loves it. Uh, so this is a very precise art too, and this is kind of what we're getting into, is not just making art, but making it very precise, making it exact, and then putting in the kind of effort into it that makes it look effortless, you know? Well, maybe not effortless, but you don't think about right angles, you don't think about rulers, you don't think about measurements when you pick this up and pop it in your mouth. You're just thinking about how good it looks. And there's a certain wow factor there, right? So. Let's get into ba some basics about cooking like an engineer. Uh, first off, there are a lot of rules, and you don't know what they all are. That's because nobody knows what they all are, right? Uh, there's a lot of chefs that have put a lot of thought into what these rules are, and have put a lot of thought into uh, doing very scientific uh, experiments. There's a lot of really great documentations coming out right now uh, about, about what the rules are. Anyone ever heard of Nathan Meervold? Anyone? He just came out with a, a set of books called Modernist Cuisine. Uh, the list price on it, I think, is $600. You can get it on Amazon for about $450. This guy, back in 1998, I think, decided he was bored being the CTO of Microsoft and took off and started cooking in kitchens. So we've got a Microsofty that is now a world-renowned chef that is putting out documentation that's really great, really great about what the rules are. He's taken a lot of things that we used to think, even a year ago, were correct, and said, you know what, not so much. Uh, it used to be common knowledge that if you want to uh, take green vegetables and have them keep their color, you, know, you put them in boiling water for 30 seconds, and then you put them into a, uh, an ice water bath to shock them and stop the cooking. He was able to prove that that does not actually stop the cooking. There are chemical reactions there going on that nobody ever uh, got into before. So there are rules there, and we're, we're probably never going to know all of them. Uh, but you guys all know the rules are there to be broken. We've all heard that, right? Um, before you try breaking rules, it really under, helps to understand why they exist in the first place. And once you understand why they can exist, we can find a loophole, right? And in fact, there's a lot of those out there. Now that I've told you to uh, follow the rules, I'm going to tell you the recipes are guidelines. Okay? This is really, really important. 
a lot of people will pull out a recipe and look at the recipe and say, wow, okay, I put in exactly, you know, they'll do the, the scoop and sweep method and put in exactly four cups of flour, or whatever, right? Um, in, the, in the bakery, it's actually a little bit more important to follow the recipe or the formula, exactly. Um, but in a kitchen, if you want to add a little bit more Tabasco, if you want to add a little bit more cayenne, you know, these are things that I always add a little bit more of, right? Um, go for it. You're not going to throw off the recipe. You're going to adapt it to suit your, your needs. And I can guarantee that almost every uh, recipe used in a restaurant has followed this. Somebody has taken a basic idea and they've used it as a guideline and they've made their own creation. And it's very much their creation most of the time, right? Um, this is really hard for, I think, everyone in this room to understand. We all, we all know it, but sometimes we don't really follow it. You are not always right. Get over it. I'm sorry, that's the way it is. At some point, somebody's going to come out and say, man, the way, we, uh, the way we used to do this thing, can we believe we used to do it that way? That was so stupid. Anyone can their own food at home or know people that do? Yeah, have you ever looked back at the way we did it 100 years ago and said, wow, really? But 100 years ago, that was the right way to do it. Heck, 18, what, 1870? What was the right way to cure a headache? Cooking. And, you know, anything else they could think of, because really, it does. <laughs> and in, in Peru, if you chew on coca leaves while you're up high, it'll take care of headaches that are due to the low oxygen levels, right? Um, of course, they didn't understand that really 100 years ago. They just knew that if they took this stuff and condensed it down and processed it, that they had a different reaction that uh, caused them to feel things they weren't feeling before. And, you know, maybe that was a good thing. And we've discovered more recently that when we refine it down to that level, it's really dangerous, right? So we need to accept that we're not always right. Uh, that means conventional wisdom is not always right. A pint is not always a pound, right? Um, I have recently, you know, somebody will tell me something. You know, 10 years ago, somebody would tell me something, and I'd say, oh, wow, that's interesting. And I would commit it to memory. It is now gospel. No, look it up. That's why we have the Googles, right? That's what those internets are for, looking things up and thinking, okay, a lot of people are suggesting that this is right. Maybe this is the right way to do, it, do things. And then maybe we go and find something that's more definitively right. It's kind of weird looking at conventional wisdom, right? But it's not always right. Don't be afraid to try new things. Um, calcium chloride. You guys know what it's used for in a lot of restaurants now? There are chefs that take, say, apple juice and add some uh, sodium alginate to it, seaweed. They'll add a little bit of that to it, and then they'll take a little eyedropper, and they'll drop it into a solution of water and calcium chloride, and they'll get what they call apple caviar. It creates this spherification effect, right? And that's kind of cool. I think it's really awesome. And that's because somebody, in fact, Ferran Adria, years ago, uh, went out and said, you know, I wonder what happens if I do this. And I wonder what happens if I do this. And he's come with a lot of really great techniques that some people like to scoff at and some people are saying, wow, this is really great. Um, and one really, really important thing, taking notes. We're all used to taking notes, right? Those of you that aren't, get used to it. Because it is one of the most useful things you can do. Okay, programmers. <laughs> Programmers that have problems with creating documentation, that's been a big problem in software since software, right? <laughs> Documenting things. You've got to take notes, understand. Uh, well, you may not understand what's happening now, but if you go back and analyze your notes later, you can say, oh, wow, maybe this happened because of this. Or maybe uh, if I want to be able to make this recipe work later, I need to do it like this. And you come up with little, little ideas, right? Little uh, things that will help you out. So let's talk about being precise. That's really, really important to cooking like an engineer. Um, measure everything. You guys remember the Gabby Gourmet? Anyone ever watched that with their mom when they were like five years old? I did. Uh, not the Galloping Gourmet. There was, there was another Gourmet. It wasn't, it wasn't Graham Care. It was another guy, some Cajun guy. And uh, one day he said, you know, uh, 
a lot of people have been writing in complaining that I never measure everything. So I'm going to be uh, extra careful about measuring everything. Pulls out a measuring cup and says, OK, we need a cup of apples. Takes a whole apple, drops in the cup, and says, OK, that's a cup. <laughs> right? Be a little bit more precise. Measure everything as, as precisely as, not as precisely as you can necessarily, but as precisely as, as is reasonable, accepting that you may have to uh, reevaluate later and decide that there's another more reasonable way to do something. Weight is more reliable than volume. We've talked about that with flour. A cup of flour is always going to weigh something a little bit differently, right? So a lot of people went out and took a bunch of averages of a cup of flour and came out with uh, 4 point, uh, four point eight ounces and said, okay, when we're talking about a cup of flour, we'll just say we're talking about 4.8 ounces. Uh, it's much more reliable. And to be honest, guys, go out and buy a kitchen scale. Go out tonight, go up to Bed Bath & Beyond or something, buy a kitchen scale, put a bowl on it, and measure some flour into it. And you'll find that measuring, you know, three pounds of flour into this, you know, onto this scale is way, way easier than going cup, scoop, cup, scoop. And well, sifting is actually important for other reasons, but you get the idea, right? Once you start uh, cooking enough, you'll discover that weight is so much easier to work with than volume. It's just something that we need to wrap our brains around because we're not used to it. A lot of people are scared when they start talking about kitchen scales. Metric is so much easier than U.S. standard, imperial, avoirdupois, however you want to call it. Uh, metric is so much easier. Uh, I've got a buddy that's been living in England for the past uh, two years. And he has discovered, as he goes out with his buddies at night, that a pint in the U.K. is a different size. It's, in fact, much bigger than a pint in the U.S. Uh, and the Brits know this, and so when the Americans come over and go out drinking with them, they like to uh, introduce them to the British pint and try and drink them under, under the table, right? Because it's so much bigger. And the American will say, well, you know, I've, I've had three pints before. I should be able to handle that. Here's the thing. It's a mental thing, right? They can. The British guys, they can't. It doesn't ever work. But if we're talking about a gram, guess what? A gram weighs the same here as it does in England. So now we have a, uh, an international reason why we should use metric. But honestly, it really, really is easier once we get our minds adapted to it. It's just a matter of we've been using inches and feet and miles and ounces and for so long. Um, what's that? 40 rods to the hogshead. Yeah. Who knows how many uh, bushels are in a bunch? Or how many bushes? Two. Two? There, there's actually all these weird, how many gallons are in a, are in a bushel? Anyone know? <coughs> I don't remember. A bushel is an actual US measurement. It's probably in there, yes. Um, when you make adjustments to your recipe, take notes on what your adjustments were. Uh, you may not think that it's all that important. Um, when you get to a really, really precise level, you'll realize that using this saucepan as opposed to using this saucepan may produce drastically different results. And moving from one to another is an adjustment, right? This one may be bigger, it may have a different bottom that's thicker, or it has iron in it, or it has copper in it, or things like that. Uh, when we add in, you know, half a cup of something, whereas we didn't before, that's an adjustment. Take notes on all these things. Monitor your progress. Write down, okay, this time when I made it, you know, it behaved like this, or my people eating it liked this about it, or whatever, right? Record res your results. Uh, and analyze, theorize, and retest. I'm going to pass a couple books around. I'm going to start at different ends of the room. These are a, a notebook that you can find on Lulu. Some guy who uh, must be incredibly handsome because he's got a red beard sells these on Lulu. This is a notebook that is designed for bakers. It's, it's based on the composition book. It's based on uh, lab notebooks. And you guys will see when you look at the pocket notebook versus the full-size notebook, there's, there's little differences. But uh, we have actual notebooks that are designed now. OK, we have a notebook that's designed now for people to record things the way that we record things. If you, when you guys get the books, when you get the big one, look in the back. There's, uh, there's some tables that uh, the way I've laid, or that gentleman has laid them out, <laughs> scares a lot of bakers because he went out to two decimal places. 
on a lot of things, and uh, really, three, four, or five decimal places would be great, but most bakers are used to no decimal places, right? Um, this gentleman, whoever it was, went out and, and did that because he knew that people like, people like us were going to be using a book like this and wanting exact measurements for scaling things up. So a lab notebook, that's a really great one to use. Uh, if you can't get a hold of that for whatever reason, wrong one. See, I should have pulled these out before I started, huh? Who's ever seen these before? I got this at the U of U bookstore. Cost me a couple bucks. Just a standard composition notebook. Grab one. Start taking notes. It's a great starter place. Um, this notebook that's being passed around is uh, Creative Commons. So if you want to uh, look at the uh, the charts and the preview on Lulu and other way, <laughs> if you want to look look at the preview and, and look at how it's done and make your own, by all means. Um, I, even as early as, I don't know, two, three months ago, I was keeping notes on three by five cards. Here's the problem. I have children. And they're tall enough that they can reach out to the counter now. And if they can't reach back, they're big enough that they can move the chair over. And, uh, Gosh, within a couple of days of me starting to take these extensive notes on three by five cards of all things that are going to get disorganized and yeah, it was a mess. That's when I started looking into other notebooks, right? Um, this is also a really great way to refer to earlier notes. Who here has kept a lab notebook? About half of us have. And what do you do every time you make an entry? Write the date. Who writes the time? It's not a bad time to start because it's nice to know I put these brownies in the oven at 447 and then I took these brownies out of the oven at 5 whatever, right? Depending on which recipe you're using. It's really nice to look at and say, okay, well I baked it at this temperature. I checked my oven thermometer because of course we're all going to go get one now because we like to know what our oven is at. I've baked it to this temperature and I've done this and we can actually start getting more precise uh, results. Dates and times um, are going to help us out with that a lot, along with writing down the temperature, writing down which oven you use. Does this sound like a lot to take notes on? Who thinks so? I'm raising my hand if it helps. I'm not used to it. I'm still trying to train myself to be more precise so that I can understand these things. Yes? Uh -huh. Like, how do you find time while you're cooking to stop and write down what you're doing? Um, it's hard. I have the same problem, and I haven't really found a really good way to, uh, to handle that. Uh, the other day, I was making marmalade, of all things, and I just wrote down some times, and I didn't write down the step. I just wrote down the time, because I, kn I knew I could go back later and say, okay, well, this is when I started this, when I stopped it, right? Guess what? It didn't work. Because on one batch, I wrote down the times, and I've never not gone through yet and actually filled it out. The other batch, I forgot to write down the end time. <laughs> not everybody may be able to do this, but there are times where my kids have been interested in what's going on, and I've been using them as scribes. For what I take yes, having an assistant is great, isn't it? So, a voice recorder is not a bad idea. Uh, I went out. When I, uh, this gentleman that designed this book went out <laughs> and read a bunch of articles about how to, how to keep lab notebooks. And a lot of people emphasized, um, write it down in your notebook, sign it when you're done, you know, don't copy one notebook to another notebook. Don't, all these weird things that really, uh, they exist not only for precision but for legal reasons. Because once you've developed something and you've taken notes on it extensively in a lab notebook, you can go back and defend that you were the one that created it. Um, that may or may not be a concern for you. You are probably not going to go be, be going through and signing all your recipes, right? Uh, you may just grab whatever writing implement you have. You may not care whether it's a pencil or a pen. In the professional lab notebook world, it's always a pen. And you always sign it at the end. And you always date it. And you always, right? Um, what I've been trying to do, uh, and this is something I've been looking at for a while, uh, is 
I'm trying to come out with a new method of taking notes that it's fast and effective. When I was a baker, I actually came out with this baking shorthand, two to four letter uh, abbreviations of all the ingredients and verbs that I used. And I could actually take very fast notes. And I kind of let it dwindle. I only did it for a couple years. I've been thinking about going back and revisiting that to take faster notes. Problem is, guess who can read it? If I give it to Tom, if I give it to Jace, if I give it to whoever, they're going to have to uh, be trained on my style before they get around to, uh, to understanding it. They might understand little things here and there, but when I use things like WE for whole eggs, that's not so intu intuitive as SUG for sugar, right? On the other hand, who here has seen shorthand? You have to be trained to read shorthand, right? So maybe it's not as big a concern. Well, there's multiple methods of shorthand too, though. There's, there's all, yeah. Um, Ferran Adria actually has come out with a, a categorization that he does uh, where he has assigned symbols to different uh, categories of food. And uh, back before his restaurant closed, you could go in there and, and look at the menu and see, you know, a set of horns that represent that you're about to eat meat. Or, you know, something that looked very similar but had the, the horns connected to the bottom that looked like an udder that symbolized you were going to eat something dairy-based, right? Uh, I think it's a great idea, but it's, it's not good for taking fast notes because you've got these huge, big pictographs that, you know, some of them have a little, bunch of little dots. Foie gras is a square with a lot of dots in the middle. That's maybe not so easy to take notes on. On the other hand, gas. Gas is an ingredient, El Bouilly. Uh, gas is a square. So I, I think there's a lot of better than that, but it's better for looking back at it as a reference later than for taking quick notes, I think. Uh, and we talked a little bit about you know, the key information, aluminum versus steel. Uh, who here has ever make, made tomato sauce? Anyone? Aluminum or steel pans? Steel? What happens if we make tomato sauce in an aluminum pan? It doesn't rust. It eats it away. It stains it. It discolors it. It does a lot of weird things. Aluminum is not what's called a non-reactive cooking vessel. right? Stainless steel, however, is. Uh, glass is non-reactive, but you're not necessarily going to be cooking on it. I know there's some really fancy pans out there that you know, are made out of glass that you can cook on. Um, ceramic, there's some great ceramic pans out there that are non-reactive. Uh, cast iron, there's some enamel-coated cast iron out there that is non-reactive. Non-enamel-coated cast iron, you know, just straight cast iron that's been cured and seasoned, it's reactive. So these are going to be important things, uh, especially if you're making things like tomato sauce. If you're working with uh, you know, something that has a lot of oil in it, cast iron may not be a, a good decision because, uh, especially if you're using like a, a vegetable oil or something, it may cause flavor to seep into the oil. Um, gas and electric perform differently. Which is better? Anyone? Yes? Wood? To be honest, you can, get, you can get some really great results with electric. If you have a choice, gas is way easier to manage, mostly because you can see how high the flame is. And that's really hard with electric, right? Uh, that said, I have electric at home, and I get by. It's not my favorite thing in the world, but you know it works. But keep in mind that they do perform differently. So I'm going to give you a use case here. Who likes rooster sauce? Sriracha. Where does it come from? What is its country of origin? Anyone know? Mexico? Mexico? Anyone else? Malaysia? Malaysia? Southeast Asia? Yeah. How about... Um, it's American. <laughs> However, the gentleman that invented sriracha was from uh, Vietnam. And uh, he was, in fact, playing with uh, different sauces like sriracha while he's over there. He immigrated to, the, to America and he couldn't find a good Vietnamese sauce that went with his pho. And he really wanted something good for that. And so he came out with this sriracha. He's actually got a few sauces like that. Uh, it is more or less an American-born sauce. Um, there is another gentleman, if you guys feel like going to that URL. Actually, I'm just going to pop. There's a gentleman that came out and said, you know what? I want to make sriracha from scratch. You guys know what this is? What kind of pepper? Red? Red jalapeno. 
That's actually really important. Have you guys ever seen a red jalapeno in the store? No. No. Have you ever seen anything labeled as a red jalapeno? Maybe. That's because in America, for some reason, they like to sell Fresnos as red jalapenos. And you can see there is a difference between them, right? Uh, there's a difference in uh, jalapenos have a little bit more meat on them. Um, there's a difference in heat. There is a, a difference in flavor. Um, but for most people that don't really get into that level of detail on chilies, you know, it's close enough, right? Sriracha actually uses red jalapenos. And this guy looked and looked and looked and finally found red jalapenos and was able to do some test batches of sriracha. In fact, you can see he did six different test batches with different variables. Uh, this is a fermented recipe. By the way, guys, I am recently really into fermented recipes. I think that this, that techniques of preserving and fermenting really is the highest level of, of scientific cooking that we can get to. And people are just barely starting to rediscover this and discover there's a lot of great things we can do with it. What kind of products do we get out of fermentation besides sriracha? Anyone? Kimchi. Kimchi? Sauerkraut. Sauerkraut? Vinegar. Vinegar. Sausages. What? Sausages? To an extent. To an extent. Pickled pig's feet. Pickled pig's feet. Pickled eggs. Actually, pickled eggs is, is a different, it's not a fermented recipe. But um, uh, beer, pickles, bread. Um, a lot of things come out of fermentation. Uh, this is, I think, a high degree of cooking that we have uh, unjustly been ignoring. But this guy went through. He did six different batches. He tried you know, brown sugar versus white sugar versus... And he went through and said, okay, um, you know, here's... He, he found a, a recipe somewhere and said, I'm going to follow this, you know, more or less uh, closely. Went through and laid out the different samples, had people come over, they tasted it. He came up with his favorite version. Now, none of his versions actually came out to be exactly like rooster sauce, right? And he states towards the bottom, if I were trying to create rooster sauce, and if I had actually created rooster sauce that made it taste exactly like it, would I have made it again? No. He'd go to the store and buy it. But what he's done here is he's now found a recipe that is uniquely his. It's close to rooster sauce, but it's his own creation. And now he has a much better understanding of the food that he's uh, putting into his mouth, right? The basic idea here, he started with the base recipe. He made it six different versions with small but very specific variations. That's really important. He compared with his control, and then he assessed which ones he liked. He didn't go back, as far as I know, and, and make any more test batches or anything like that. He was happy with what he came up with. But you kind of get the idea. This is a really good uh, example. So, uh, techniques versus recipes versus formulas. I've mentioned a couple times formulas. Um, in bakeries, we use formulas. In the kitchen, we use recipes. Um, a technique is just a way of doing something. The muffin myth mixing method. You guys know how to make brownies? Anyone know the technique for baking brownies? What's up? <laughs> you mix the stuff, you put it in the oven. Right. That would be the straight method. Mix it all together and bake it. Uh, brownies, you take all the, uh, the butter and the chocolate and you melt it together. And then you add in some sugar. And then you add in the eggs. Uh, vanilla or whatever flavoring you're going to use. Then you add in the flour. And then you put it in your pan and you put it in the oven. Right? Who likes really uh, soft, cake-like brownies? <coughs> Anyone? Who likes really chewy brownies? Who likes really crispy brownies? Really? I think edges should be chewy, personally. But, you know, it's, it's up to the individual person, right? But the basic idea behind making uh, brownies is, is that. You melt the two things together, and you start adding it in stages. Uh, the muffin mixing method, you take all the white stuff, including sugar. You mix it together in one bowl. You take all the dry stuff, flour and, you know, baking powder, baking soda, whatever. You mix it in another bowl. Then you mix those two bowls together, and then you put it in muffin tins. That's the muffin method, right? And there's actually a lot of well-known methods like that. Straight mixing method is you take everything and you put it all together. And then you bake it, right? A recipe is where we actually have a list of ingredients that is, you know, more or less specific. But you have a list of ingredients and a, a set of guidelines, not rules, but guidelines for putting them together, right? Um, anyone, have, uh, anyone have a good chili recipe? 
A couple of people do? Are you going to share? I don't know if I Okay. But the basic idea, you have meat and or beans. You have some vegetables. You've got chilies, because that's why we call it chili, right? Uh, and you, you may put them together in a specific order. You may uh, you know, put some oil in a pan and saute your vegetables and saute your meat. Or you may have whatever, uh, whatever I'm going to say method, but it's not really a method. You have a recipe that you use to put together your chili, right? Um, formula is where we actually say we use exactly this much of this and we use exactly this much of this and they go in, in exactly this order and you do exactly this with them. Uh, that's really big in bakeries because uh, baking, you know, putting this flour stuff together with all these other things, it's really more of a, a science than anything else. In fact, uh, when I worked in a bakery that happened to share a lot of kitchen space with the, the chefs, with the regular cooks, uh, we made fun of each other a lot. And you see that rivalry, rivalry a lot because you know, we have a different way of thinking. You know, people use recipes versus people use formulas. Um, I'm going to talk about what I call composite recipes. Um, this is something that I started doing a while ago. And I think that every cook or baker does this to some degree. Um, they may not do it to the level that I do it. I use a spreadsheet. I, one day I shared a spreadsheet with an old uh, pastry chef that I used to work for, and she looked at it and said, whoa, I don't get all that scientific. I'm like, what? what? I'm just taking different recipes and comparing them side by side. This one uses this much sugar, and this one uses, and so on, right? Uh, what, I, what I would do is find different recipes for about what I was looking for, and I'd put them side by side in a spreadsheet. I'd lay out, okay, this one uses you know, a cup of flour, and you know, this is actually where I kind of get uh, not, not so scientific, I kind of take some wild stabs, some wild guesses at it, and say, okay, well, uh, these couple of recipes use two cups of flour, this one uses two and a half, this one uses, uh, and so on, and I make something up, right, <laughs> that looks about right, and I bake it. And I look at it and say, okay, well, it behaved like this, and I know that if I add more, you know, if I use oil instead of butter, I know I'm going to get a more moist mouthfeel. So, this one's not very moist, so maybe I'll add that. Or maybe if I do this. And that's where I start getting scientific with it. Uh, so you prepare it as formulated, analyze, make small changes, retest, uh, ad nauseum until you get what it is that you actually want, right? And then I have what I'm, what I'm currently calling a base reference recipe. Um, there's so a lot of recipes out there that are really basic, no frills version of recipe. Um, as an example, one day I got really, really into cheesecake. And I started looking at a lot of cheesecakes. I don't know how many dozens I looked at it that day while I was work, working. And uh, at some point I said, OK, as near as I can tell, a basic cheesecake recipe is going to have, for every one egg, there's going to be a quarter cup of sugar and eight ounces of cream cheese and half a teaspoon of vanilla extract. That's what I came out with. And I thought, okay, that looks pretty reasonable, but I'm, st I'm still looking at recipes. Two recipes later, I found Nick Malgeri's Basic No Frills New York Cheesecake. Guess what? One cup of sugar, two pounds of cream cheese, four eggs, two teaspoons of vanilla extract. Nailed it. Awesome, huh? So that's a basic No Frills recipe. That's a good reference recipe. And now we can take this recipe that, you know, it's no frills, there's nothing big about it, there's no like habanero orange sauce or anything special like that, but that's where we start adding those things in and turn it into our own thing, right? There's not really any standard base reference recipes out there right now, but there are some that kind of fit the bill. In fact, I might even call Toll House Cookies uh, a, a base reference recipe. In fact, if you go over here and look, if you go over to Nestle's website, they'll redirect you over to these guys to get the basic Toll House recipe. Anyone know the history of this? This woman was getting, she was making chocolate cookies one day and she thought it would be a really great idea to just take the chocolate and chop it up and mix it into the dough and then bake it and she thought it would homogenize while it was baking. Turns out it doesn't, right? But her staff said, wow, these are so great and we should sell these and this woman, until she died, hated this recipe. It was not what she wanted. She wanted chocolate cookies, not chocolate chip cookies. But Nestle came to her at some point and said, hey, you know what? If you will give us exclusive rights to use this recipe, we will give you a lifetime worth of chocolate. 
and she ran a bed and breakfast, and you know that helps the bottom line, right? Getting all your chocolate for free. And so she sold her recipe for a lifetime worth of chocolate. <laughs> Another one, Rice Krispie Treats. This is a basic no frills recipe. In fact, I might even call this a standard, standard recipe. Um, there's things like, you know, I don't know why it says this here. I only put food into my, my food. But <laughs> there's a, this is a really basic recipe that you can start adding stuff to. Anyone ever add chocolate chips to Rice Krispie cookies or Rice Krispie treats? It's kind of hard because it does homogenize, right? How about M&Ms? Those actually wait till they get to your mouth, not your hands, right? Um, anyone done uh, cinnamon drops or cinnamon, uh, you know, red hots? Red hots are good, right? And then the last one. This is a uh, a less common recipe. I came across this some years ago and decided this was actually a really good base reference recipe. This makes a pretty decent plate of brownies. This does not make my favorite plate of brownies but it's a really good starting point. In fact, this would be a good time if you want to start passing out the, uh, the brownies. Everyone, don't eat your brownies yet. We're going to talk about them and compare them, okay? You'll notice when you get your brownies, they are color-coded. If anyone wants to help James out, that would really be great. Um, we have some brownies that we've... Because Blue Host is always helpful. <laughs> it's here for Blue Host. <laughs> So we've got a test case here, the brownies. If anyone wants to pull that up and look at it while we're talking. First off, what is wrong with this recipe? As engineers, there's no algorithm. There's no algorithm. What's wrong with that first ingredient? What's a square? So, you guys ever seen this before? This is regular baker's baking chocolate. Right? Baking chocolate means unsweetened chocolate. This is just straight chocolate and, and cocoa butter, right? This thing is eight ounces and it has eight squares in it. So, and in fact, this is actually really standard. If you get uh, baking squares of chocolate, they will be one ounce. You can be pretty much assured that regardless of your supplier, if you get a baking square of chocolate, it will be one ounce. Isn't that nice? So now we know that we have six ounces of baking chocolate. How much butter? Not enough. Not enough. Awesome. How much salt? Not enough, right? <laughs> Actually, salt would be a really great addition to this. Salt is one of those things that makes things taste more like themselves. You're welcome, Tom. Uh, the salt really would, have, would be a great addition to this. Salt is... I've heard a couple things about salt. It's, it's the thing that makes food taste bad when it's there. And it's the thing that makes food taste more like itself. Uh, it's something that you miss when it's not there. It would be really great to add salt. I did not. I'm sticking to the recipe pretty closely. But three quarters of a cup of butter, we know that's six ounces. Um, that's, we, we could do better. Uh, two cups of sugar. Anyone know? That would be 14.2 ounces. How about eggs? I went through and actually added the word large there. So we have large eggs. Anyone know how big a large egg is? Ostrich. Ostrich? No. One large chicken egg. Actually, 24, 12 large chicken eggs, a dozen chicken eggs, is 24 ounces. And it's actually like 22 to 26 ounces, something in there. There's a window that is federally mandated. They're actually, the funny thing about that is if you open up a dozen eggs, you'll notice they're not all the same size. But, you know, the average is about that, right? So that's two ounces per egg, including shell. I'll tell you right now, it's, a shell weighs about a third of an ounce, give or take. So we'll say 1.7 ounces, okay? A teaspoon of vanilla extract, it's actually really hard to weigh at that level. So I don't mind so much using a teaspoon. But when you get up to the point where you're making 500 brownies, it's, a, well, that one's probably going to be accurate up to 500 brownies if you're... Uh, opening up a big factory and making 500 brownies a minute, that won't work. Okay, we got to have a better way to scale that. And a cup of flour, we know the problem with that, right? We know it's 4.8 ounces, but if you're using a measuring cup, you're probably not getting 4.8 ounces. What's the other problem with this recipe? 
We're just looking at the ingredient list. Okay, you'll notice that I didn't put any steps up there or anything. One big problem, this is all by volume, right? And it's imperial, it's US standard. So, let's fix it. We've converted it all to weight. We've converted it all to metric. Uh, and you'll notice there's some percentages at the end. These are called Baker's percentages. This is, what's that? Stay with me. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about that. Um, now this is, this is interesting with Baker's percentages. And this actually is standard and common in, in the bakery. And this is why we call them formulas. Flour is 100%. That's the standard. If flour is present in the recipe, it is 100%. And everything else is a percentage based on that. So, baking chocolate, we have 25% more of that. So we have 125% baking chocolate. Suddenly it makes a lot more sense. And that's, that's by weight? Um, that is by weight, yes. You notice I even converted vanilla extract to weight, 4.7 grams. We can now scale this, theoretically, infinitely, right? Of course, there's problems with hydration and other things at, at high volumes that might throw us off a little bit, and you know it may be it may need to be adjusted for an automated machine or something like that. But we have something that's much much easier to work with on a precise level. So you guys, you'll notice that we've got four different types of brownies per person, right? I have color coded these. I did a, a batch that is uh, all butter and uh, baking chocolate, all butter and cocoa. Half oil and half butter, and baking chocolate, and then, and then cocoa powder, right? And you guys can, can line this up with what's on your trays, because it's all color-coded. Notice something interesting about the cocoa powder, the texture on them. You guys notice something interesting when you look at the one in front of you? There's a lot more bubbles in the cocoa than the chocolate one. A lot more bubbles in this one? Yep. A lot more bubbles in this one, right? Anything else? You notice there's a a really interesting texture that's kind of unexpected maybe. The color, the, color is much darker. the color is much, much darker, right, with cocoa powder. There's a lot of really great reasons for this. One of the reasons you get the texture is because baking coda, or baking powder, I'm sorry, cocoa powder, thank you, um, as far as we know, has no fat. That's not actually true. This is like 10% fat or something. Uh, whereas, in fact, that's how we get it to powder. This stuff here is probably more fat than cocoa solids. And so we have a lot more fat, and so it's going to spread a lot more. And this thing, literally, I was sitting there with a rubber spatula, pressing it down into shape, trying to get everything even, you know, almost resorting to a, uh, a rolling pin. Uh, some of you guys might have noticed that your uh, cocoa powder based ones are really, really, really chewy and some of them, some of you guys that got really thin ones might notice they're kind of brittle and crispy, right? And if anyone wants to try them out afterwards to see the difference, I get plenty of brownies. Is that oil? Is, there, is that oil and butter? That is vegetable oil. And uh, red and green have no oil at all? This, this is just butter and this is half butter, half vegetable oil. Four ounces of each one, or three ounces of each one. What's, what's, what's that word again? You guys know what margarine is? Crude oil. It's where they take vegetable oil and they hydrolyze it. They, they actually, well, not hydrolyze. They, uh, they take nickel and use it as a uh, catalyst to add hydrogen ions to the, uh, to the vegetable oil and saturate it so that it ends up being a little bit more solid at room temperature. That is what margin is. Nickel. Nickel is what they usually use. But that's just the catalyst. That's just the catalyst, yeah. It's not actually in there. Right. And that does, that does a lot of really interesting things to it that are not so great for us. But uh, and in fact, butter, in terms of trans fatty acids, is probably actually better for us than margarine. But so many of us have grown up on margarine that butter is hard to deal with sometimes. So a lot of people are still used to that. Uh, as it turns out though, vegetable oil is much less saturated and it's, it has how much moisture in it? How much moisture do we have in oil? No moisture, right? Oil is actually dry, but it gives a moist mouthfeel. 
How do we know it's a dry ingredient? How, we know, how do we know it has no water in it? Because if it did, the water would be on the bottom and the oil would be on the top, right? Yeah, because water is so much more dense than oil. So, uh, so we know that we, if we had cocoa powder, we're going to get a little bit chewier recipe maybe. We're, it's going to be darker. Uh, because uh, specifically because of the cocoa powder that I use, you can actually get cocoa powder that is red. You can get cocoa powder that is black. It depends on how many alkalines they added to it. It depends on how dark they roasted. It depends on a lot of things. But uh, by the way, this is the cocoa powder I used because this is really basic uh, cocoa powder you see in most stores. Uh, I'm not endorsing the brand or anything. Uh, but it's a good tasting cocoa powder. This is the baking chocolate I used. Again, very common. A lot of people think that baker's chocolate is, you know, baker's is baking chocolate. It's a pretty reasonable assessment, right? It's a brand name. Um, if I were making it for myself and I only had this available, I might add some of this to give it a little bit darker flavor. This is instant espresso powder. A lot of people in the, these parts don't like that. <coughs> And so you might try this. This is a, a Colombian brand that is it's so dark, it tastes like coffee. It has no coffee in it. But this is a little baker's trick. A lot of bakeries, when they want to make chocolate treats taste more chocolatey, a little bit deeper flavor, they'll add instant espresso powder. They could add this if, you know, they could track it down. I've had problems finding it, but it makes a really, really great brownie. But what really makes the best brownie of all, in my ever so humble opinion, is some of this, some of this. In fact, I usually use like two ounces of this and four ounces of this, something like that. So, actually, I tried some brownies a while ago. The guy that runs Creo Brew gave me some sample of cocoa powder he's playing with. It's a lot less dense. Um, makes an interesting brownie that is not very chocolatey at all. It's good on its own merits, but it really needs some, some cocoa powder added to it. So, you guys, do you guys eat your brownies yet? You can eat them now. I give you permission. You see the differences? Are you tasting the differences? There's a difference in texture, certainly. You notice, like I said, the stuff with oil in it is probably a little bit uh, more moist tasting. This is, I think, the fluffiest brownie, right? And I think this one is the densest brownie, yeah. right? You got a crunchy one? There's some chewy ones up here too. What's that? Yeah. Um, different, different thicknesses of different parts of the pan, right? It was really hard to get it right. And if you want more, they're up here. They're, the pans are still color coded, right, James? Okay. Mm -hmm. Really thick. So you'll notice that I didn't, there's some things I didn't do. I didn't do them with all oil. If I had, we would call it cake. Honestly, uh, it would be much, much more cake-like. If we added you know, some sort of leavening agent, it would definitely be cake. That would make a pretty serviceable cake recipe. This guy would have been really, really great if I had added some milk, honestly. Uh, it would have given it a little bit creamier taste. Uh, it would have made it, make it easier to, to pan out. It would have made it a little bit less chewy. Uh, there's a lot of variations we can do. We also didn't do uh, equal parts uh, baking chocolate and cocoa powder, right? But that would have made a really, really great brownie. So, you guys have any questions? I think I'm exactly out of time, but it's dinner time. So any questions? I hope that's just because you're all eating brownies. Oh, no. Yes. We're going to get one of these fine t-shirts. You can get one of these fine t-shirts on Spreadshirt. I know the guy that sells them. <laughs> Come talk to me and I'll get you the URL. Uh, in fact, where's my books? Yes. Oh, that, I don't have to answer that. Oh. Um, which one's the best? It's it's subjective. Where's my where's my other book? Right. Are there two of them back there. Green is the best. I'd go for red. The red one. Yellow is better. See, now it's subjective. I haven't even tasted me up. I don't know. Mike, what's up? So, since what is the best is so subjective, how do you actually determine that and measure that when you're trying to determine which 
Think about who your demographic is, your target demographic. I mean, look at the way that companies do it. They'll bring in panels, they'll have 10 people taste a bunch of brownies, and then they'll decide, and then they'll have 10 more people come in and taste a bunch of brownies. Uh, but really, it's up to you and whoever you're cooking for, right? If you're cooking for yourself, make the one you really like. If you're cooking it for your, for your family, um, and if one turns out better to th than the other for them, they'll get over it, because you're cooking for you, right? <laughs> That, that's the thing. At some point, it's subjective, right? At some point, yes, it's really nice to have precise beauty in here. It's, it's really nice to be able to do things accurately and so on. But if it tastes like crap, you're not going to make it again, right? Yes? So you kind of blew me away with saying that the oil gives it more of a moist flavor texture. Yes. Where do you learn that? Where do you learn things like that? And that substituting this for that is going to give this different end result. Um, well, I went to school, so that helps. Uh, there's a lot of websites and books that'll they'll have really great information about that. Uh, you spend enough time working in a bakery, you will learn that oil gives a, generally gives a more, more moist mouthfeel than, and it makes sense. It's fluid at room temperature, whereas butter is waxy at room temperature, right? Or plastic, at least. Um, and there's a lot of things that just seem to make sense. Of course, a lot of those things are wrong. But this is one that's, that's actually true. It makes sense that something that is fluid at room temperature would be more fluid in your mouth, right? Um, there's a, uh, I forget where I was gonna go with that. Uh, there really is a lot of great information online. Uh, something I learned when I was uh, uh, baking uh, professionally was uh, this is a Weight Watchers trick. You can replace in almost every recipe, cup for cup, butter with applesauce. You guys want to try some applesauce brownies when you get home? That might work. And applesauce is most definitely going to give it a more moist mouthfeel, right? Uh, in cakes, it's really great. Like if you're making a spice cake, you can take out all the fat, 100%, ounce for ounce, and replace it with applesauce and have a really good cake. And with a spice cake, that would work really well. With chili, maybe not so much, right? You're certainly not going to saute stuff in applesauce. It's, there's limited applications, right? But... Yes. And you can you can come up with some really really great stuff by doing that. Apple butter would be awesome, and very intense. Apple. I don't know how well, well that would work because you have a different moisture level and you know. Anyway. Anyone else? Okay, I'm going to give away. Oh, thank you. I'm going to give away some books.